uh, uh, I was introduced, I'm Igor Spilegoy from University of California, San Diego. Uh, and yeah, this talk is different than the previous one for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is, it's not yet another physics um, application. I have done uh, Fusion and did porting to, uh, to GPUs with OpenATC with Fusion, but this time we do, uh, I have attacked something completely different, which is microbiome research. Uh, and I have been working with uh, Daniel McDonald and Rob Knight from Knight Lab. And actually this night is the same night. Uh, he's running a big microbiome um, lab in um, San Diego. And here's a nice slide that tries to, uh, to show you that microbiology is really what connects the human body to the planet. And this is really comes home when you look at the gut microbiome. We are really uh, are what we eat. There have been several studies demonstrating a clear link between gut microbiome and the general human health. And um, once when you look at uh, uh, those things, if you really want to understand how similar pairs of microbiome samples uh, are with respect to evolutionary histories of the uh, organisms that are in there. And a very popular metric for that is the unitrack uh, distance, which in simple terms means uh, that if you have uh, two set of organisms that are very similar from an uh, evolutionary perspective, you get a very small unitrack distance. And on the other hand, can, if you have two samples that are composed of very different organisms, you have a very large unitrack distance. And then you com uh, com uh, compute all the possible uh, combinations and you get a nice matrix that uh, the microbiology uh, scientists work on. Now, I'm not a microbiologist. Uh, uh, I am a computer scientist uh, by heart and I have been pulled into uh, this uh, project because they were uh, starting uh, to get more and more samples and the compute uh, was getting way and way longer. Now, Unlike the previous uh, speakers, microbiologists are not in the HPC domain. Uh, they typically run on laptops, and uh, using a small dedicated cluster is a stretch. And they really didn't want to go into the HPC domain. So the question was, can we actually uh, get our compute back to our laptops, even uh, as the uh, sample size are growing uh, exponentially, essentially, year after year? So here we go and uh, start talking about compute. Now, we want to compute uh, a matrix. And the nice uh, property of this matrix is that it's pretty much all independent. You can process it in stripes, and each stripe is completely independent. So we can give, uh, give it to a different processor to jump on. And they did all, uh, this already before uh, I showed up. And while the code is a little more complicated than that, this is where 99% of the time was spent on the CPUs. On a 14-core uh, E5 V4 CPU, which is not uh, the latest, uh, greatest these days, but it's not too ancient. It's actually about two times faster uh, than uh, a modern uh, high-end uh, server CPU. 13 hours starts to be a lot. There's definitely way more than you could run uh, on a laptop. So the question was, can we uh, get this code uh, and uh, get it uh, on the GPU? By the way, this loop is called multiple times for different uh, uh, AMP, uh, buffers of EMB that's for embedded. But essentially, this is a function that they had and they wanted to accelerate. And so we said, okay, uh, looks like a nice case for OpenACC. Can we do it? Let's try. And it was almost as easy as adding an OpenACC program in front of it. The part that was not com completely transparent was the fact that we were using an array of pointers. And there is no easy way to have an array of pointers in OpenACC v2 if you explicitly manage all the uh, memory. So I had to do a little bit of refactoring by putting all the um, uh, buffers in a single big buffer and then just do a little bit of uh, um, pointer arithmetic. But this is really, inside this routine, this is all I had to change. And everything just worked. And voila, 
we were running on uh, on the GPU, and the V100 uh, was now taking uh, about an hour and a half, which is a great speed up uh, compared that we started with uh, 13 hours. By the way, just uh, for, for context, this kind of code is usually invoked as a module um, inside a, a bigger Python script. So this is really a library that usually people launch from a Python script. So it's really nice if you can get it uh, in the single um, node, although for um, we have an external executable where we can split the problem over multiple nodes and then merge, and then you uh, load that uh, independently. But that's really not the preferred way of doing. We will do it uh, when needed. Now, the speed up was considered great, but um, since I uh, started looking at the problem, I, I couldn't get myself the, to, uh, to just give up uh, after having it run on GPU. So I started to look at the code. And there were a, a few things that jumped uh, to the eye. First was they were doing manual unrolling of the loop in, inside the code because it helped uh, the CPU code. Uh, all uh, the CPUs these days have short vectors, so doing rolling inside is good. But OpenACC will do the vectorization at the loop level. So we were uh, doing striped access to a memory to memory, which the GPUs really don't like, and it's not. These are not the same stripes, it's just stripes inside uh, uh, the streaming vectors. So first thing, I remove this thing uh, and just let the compiler do the right thing. Second thing, I said we uh, run this, loop, call this loop, uh, this function many times. So there were a lot of invocations for relatively short kernels. So I said, hmm, how about we batch these calls together and we just pre-create a big embedded buffer and uh, just run of it multiple times. And when you do that, uh, you also can notice, oh, we don't have to uh, write in, uh, read and write from the global memory every single time. We can just read a lot of time the embedded buffer and write just once. And since writes are significantly more expected than reads, this gives you a big speed up. And indeed, by doing these uh, simple steps, we got another 3x speed up. Uh, by the way, uh, the, all the, uh, you see I use present here. I do explicit memory movement and the movement in and out of uh, the, uh, between the host and the GPU memory is done before I call this and I actually do it asynchronously. Uh, uh, it's not, for most problems, not a big deal. Um, I can earn about 10% speed up, but Recently, I have been doing much bigger problems, and I, uh, it can get up to the 50% uh, faster if you uh, do proper asynchronous transfer outside uh, the loop. Uh, one minor uh, notice, when you do memory uh, accesses, make sure they are well aligned. You can, uh, the, the speed difference between well aligned buffers and non aligned buffers can be up to 5x. And especially when you batch together stuff, if uh, the original buffer size was unaligned, and you just try to concatenate them, everything gets uh, screwed up. So I use a little bit of uh, uh, padding at the end uh, if needed in order to get really nice aligned uh, reads because the uh, code uh, speed up is really uh, uh, big, up to 5x uh, in certain cases. Now this looks good. So 3x over previous with 26x compared uh, to the original CPU. And unless the previous, unlike the previous CPU, when I saw say a CPU, I mean a whole chip. I don't think comparing CPU cores to GPUs makes sense because GPUs have like 2,000 cores. Uh, but I was still not satisfied. So I was keeping looking at this. And what, what I noticed is that we were not doing an, any smart thing about uh, reads. We were just churning through and trashing the caches. Yes, GPUs have caches too. It's a little less important than in CPUs, but still uh, get caches. If you notice, this one only depends on K. So going all over the, all over the, uh, uh, reading multiple times for each stripe makes no sense. So how about we invert the, the loops? So we put the K outside, stripe inside. You still need to uh, keep, um, a little bit of uh, the original uh, K loop 
here so it can be properly vectorized because uh, all GPU uh, is vectorized, not in the CPU sense, but it's still uh, going in vector. So you really have to think in vector mode when you do compute. But this simple inversion got me another 3x. Two lines of code change 3x speed up. Know that the profiler would not really help here because uh, it tells you I was using 100% of the GPU all the time. Uh, you really need to uh, look at cache misses. And the cache misses went down by an order of magnitude here, and this is why you get a 3x speed up. So this was great. And the even be better thing is all these changes actually were a great improvement for the CPU speed too. So we, we got a 9x speed up on GPU, but also 4x speed up on the CPU. And we can act now actually keep a single code base for everything we do, and it's beneficial for both the GPU and the CPU side. And here is uh, a summary of all the numbers. We went from originally 800 minutes on the uh, uh, Xeon down to about 119 uh, CPUs on the same Xeon. And when you go to the V100, you go to about 12 uh, CPUs, which is win-win. However, as I said, a, a lot of our users want to use uh, workstations, desktops, laptops, and that means gaming or mobile GPUs. And mobile and gaming GPUs are not good at 64 bit compute or double precision. So we said, what if we tried doing it in single precision? We actually checked, and the uh, precision uh, loss was small enough that it's negligible. So it's the science can be done in single precision. It was never done simply because there's very little benefit in doing it on the CPU. Single double precision was about the same size, speed. And it's not that much of an uh, improvement on a V100 either. Well, 20%, nice, but not game changing. But when you go on uh, mobile gaming GPUs, it's huge. Uh, it's four, uh, four times on the mobile GPUs, which really makes a big difference. Uh, and by switching to that, now you can do on a laptop uh, the same compute way faster than we would uh, before do on even uh, two socket uh, server class CPUs. So problems that were before considered hard on uh, on a server node are now doable uh, on a laptop. And when you go to re uh, more uh, bigger problems, 100K sample is this although we are getting bigger, but this is pretty much the biggest part of the case. And if you try to compute Unifrac on that with the original code, you would need a small cluster, which would each, each take uh, several hours. Uh, now, the CPU code improvements uh, brought it down to an hour and a half, but it's still a small cluster uh, to get something reasonably done. If we use GPUs, we can do it in a single, uh, on a single node. It's 20 minutes with four GPUs, and we have notes with four GPUs. Uh, it, but even if I had a single V100, it would be done in an hour and a half, which is comparable to what each CPU on a cluster was taking. And it's even possible on a, a, a desktop right now. Even if I have a single 2080 Ti, I can be do, done in eight hour and a half, which it's not great, but it's still good. But if I have 16, that's half an hour. So it, it's really a game changer uh, for uh, this community that it's not in the HPC mindset. They usually don't ask allocations of the big centers. They really want to uh, work on uh, their personal devices and at most their small clusters. So that's what I have uh, and what we did. Uh, I was asked to provide some feedback of uh, what experience was and what could uh, be improved. And my major complaint would be the support for an array of pointers. Uh, as far as I understand, it doesn't work in uh, uh, OpenACC v2. Uh, I was able to work around it, but it's annoying. I've told that v3 has this pretty much solved. I haven't tried it. Would be nice to have better multi-GPU support. We currently just split the problem in multiple independent uh, processes, uh, run them uh, independently, then um, uh, merge the result, which we, is the functionality we want uh, to have for big problems. But for small problems, would be more uh, convenient for the users if a single process could use multiple GPUs. Because as I said, typical use cases, 
you launch it as a uh, module inside uh, a py inside Python, you don't want to uh, deal with multiple processes. That's fine for really big problems. You can live with it, but it's not what users really want. And most our high-end nodes have multiple GPUs these days. The next uh, thing is what to do about the AMD GPUs. Uh, as you can, you saw there, it was all about NVIDIA GPUs. Now, I know GCC has support for it, and actually I tried it, but the performance was so dismal that I didn't spend more than a few hours trying it out, and it was so painfully slow that I just said, okay, forget it. It's not usable. Maybe I did something really wrong and would be happy to be proven uh, wrong, but uh, I couldn't make it to work. And finally, non-Linux support. Everything we do on the service is Linux, which is great, but when you start talking laptops, nobody uses Linux on laptops. Mac OS rules uh, and Windows is a close second. And right now I don't know how to co compile for uh, OpenACC with GPU support on either Mac OS or Windows. So some help uh, would be uh, great too. And that, that's really all I have. Just to summarize and conclude, uh, OpenACC made porting Uniflex to GPUs extremely easy. Uh, it was done in a day. Uh, uh, in, we kept the single uh, code base, which it was really, really a, a good thing. Uh, I did I spent more time doing optimizations, which did pay off, but to a certain degree they were needed for the CPU anyway. I just was not involved uh, with this code base before, so uh, we can discuss how much is OpenACC specific and how much is not, but thinking in Parallel turns actually helped because it turned out uh, they thought the code was a CPU bound, uh, compute bound, it's really memory bound, and GPUs are really good at memory bound problems. And the performance of the NVIDIA GPUs is simply great, uh, way beyond our best expectations. However, right now I don't have any idea how to uh, use uh, uh, the OpenACC code path for either AMD GPUs or non Linux systems. So some Suggestions there would be uh, uh, very welcome. That's all I have.